is up, theology nerds. This is Trip, and today on the podcast is a friend of the pod. Mm-hmm. Scholar, author, regular keynote speaker, and downright awesome person, Diana Butler Bass. And we we just got done live streaming. We live streamed last night. Now I'm sharing it on the podcast. We discuss her new book. Freeing Jesus, uh, how it is the culmination of uh, the four different books exploring the nature of faith and Christianity after religion, uh, from her book, Christianity After Religion, through Grounded, through um, Gratitude to the new book, Freeing Jesus. And then we end up uh, answering a whole host of questions uh, sent in by you, dear listeners, and, uh, and those of you that were on the live stream. So I hope you enjoy this, uh, because it was fun. And... Um, yeah, and if you did, um, make sure you go over to uh, the different uh, streams, you could say, that video gets live streamed on. I always share it on the Homebrew Twitter, um, on uh, my YouTube channel, um, and also on the Facebook page. You can go to any of those, follow it in, in, in ways that you know if we're doing live streams. If the guest is like, I will be interviewed, not really have it edited, and you know, have a video on the internet, then then I'm going to try to do some more of these, right, that are sh- straight up streams. And I really enjoyed interacting with people in the comments during it, getting their questions and suggestions for discussion topics. But uh, yeah, before we hop in uh, to this very fun conversation, I just want to let you all know that we just kicked off our next online reading group. It is called Religion. And spiritual in the spiritual crisis, religion in the spiritual crisis, and it's with Andy Root. You can go to oursecularage.com and sign up. Oursecularage.com. It is an open pop-up online learning community, and that means you can donate between zero and a million dollars and join over a thousand ministers. Because this this class is geared towards ministers, but you know anyone is welcome to join. Have already signed up. Uh, the first session was just this week. It was a blast. And I'm super pumped. We're reading Charles Taylor, who wrote the book Secular Age, uh, and Hartmont Rosa, um, who who kind of continues his uh, project and expounds the way our contemporary culture and economy shapes us as human beings and problematizes uh, life of deep uh, of resonance and meaning and such. So, yeah, head over to OurSecularAge.com. Join the fun. And if you say to yourself, trip, trip, it does sound good. Um, but I, I, I mean, I, I can't just show up all the time on these streams and stuff. What if I just want to get access to all the content and maybe conveniently in a podcast feed just like this one? And I would say, well, maybe you should join the Homebrewed community. Maybe you should go to homebrewedcommunity.com. You sign up and then you get invited to our private Facebook group. You Get a uh, a level appropriate podcast feed that is packed full of hundreds of extra episodes, including all the content from past and present classes. You know, like the Hebrew Bible class with Walter Brueggemann, walking through process and reality with John Cobb, becoming Christian uh, with Tom Orr, the Black theology class with uh, Adam Clark, Diana Butler Bass and I's religion and politics in, a, uh, in an America class called Ruining Dinner. Anyway, check it out, homebrewedcommunity.com. And uh, thanks for listening. And don't forget to share the brew. Share it far and wide, you know, because sharing is caring. Enjoy. Well, friends, guess what? Diana Butler Bath is back on the podcast and hanging out in a live stream. And uh, we're going to be uh, talking about Jesus. And there's a whole host of other questions people send in that are related to different topics and uh, things that Diana's written about. Um, But uh, one of the funnest, uh, uh, most fun questions that was sent in, and it's not related to Jesus, even though your new book is indeed about Jesus, is um, what what, what was the new discovery for Diana in lockdown, either like TV show, music, movie, craft, activity. What was the thing that if there was no lockdown, you would have not found it? And then you said, oh, I'm down. Oh, (laughs) 
Oh my gosh, that's a that is a fun and, and great question. Um, I have to confess that murder shows on Netflix. I became mm. one of those people, and <laughs> so when when Saturday Night Live did the send up of the women who wanted to kick their husbands out of their houses during <laughs> during lockdown to watch murder shows, that literally is my house. So I would go. I I will sometimes go into uh, the bedroom and close the door, and my husband Richard will will peek in, and he'll go, "What are you watching?" And I'll go, "Murder show," and he he just leaves. <laughs> so I've now watched murder shows in Norwegian, Spanish, mm. English, French, you name it, uh, from all over the world, and and so I'm I've been kind of hooked. Oh, I'm yeah. I mean. I, I I followed the viewing path of my twelve turn that turned thirteen year old over lockdowns. So we did like all the big trilogies, like you know Star Wars, <laughs> Harry Potter. Watched all, everything and through Lord of the Rings. We even watched all the Hobbit movies, which you know, compared to the Lord of the Rings, but um, <laughs> they had plenty of fights, so he liked it. Uh, then then it got into like uh, '90s movies with like the people I watched in SNL. And, you know, every one of those movies has, like, two jokes that he looks at me. He's like, are you allowed to do that? I'm like, (laughs) yes. uh, I saw some of my friends who are in their 30s just this week. uh, There's been here in the States uh, running on a couple of networks, actually. The old um, Back to the Future series. Mm -hmm. And they've been showing it over and over again. And, And so it's really interesting seeing people I know who are on Twitter who are you know, 20, 30 years younger than me, they'd never seen it before. <laughs> to see their reactions to Back to the Future has been kind of hilarious and kind of precious as, as well. <laughs> so, yeah. So if you haven't let, if you haven't talked your kids into watching the Back to the Future movies, you really need to step up. You need that's to step right. Up. Absolutely. Yeah. You got to, uh, you got to free the DeLorean and Jesus. Look at that what? transition. <laughs> What kind of what kind of millennial are you if you haven't introduced your kids to <laughs> Back to the Future yet? Because you got to make fun of the skateboard and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Well, so, um, so you have, you have your books right behind you. Grab it for a second so you can show oh, everyone. I have oh, another you one have on my an, desk. Oh, you even have it conveniently placed next to the uh, the plant right under the plant. Yeah, that's back there. So people can't forget you know and yeah. my my agent says that that has to be there at all times so. Oh. <laughs> so. well you know diane i have not had an agent rate my background of zoom during lockdown it it's really it, i'm going for a, a particular aesthetic yeah you are i think sort of um early medieval basement yeah well i or or like someone that was like went alt right started building bombs in their basement. There was always that as an option. The, uh, or, or you could be a good guy and yeah. you could be going for British lockdown during World War II. Oh, yeah. I like that yeah. better. All right. <laughs> but so anyway, there's this is the book Freeing Jesus. Mm-hmm. And so, then it has a long subtitle. Rediscovering Jesus as friend, teacher, savior, Lord, way and presence. Just like in the 19th century. I've always wanted a long subtitle like that. Oh, well, I just want you to know that um, I was just glad the book wasn't technically a Christology because I, I was like, I liked it too much. I didn't want to say it was my favorite Christology that came out the same year mine did. I know. So <laughs> I appreciate you sticking with Jesus. Like, uh, uh, but, but maybe you could say a bit about um, when you go to write a book on Jesus, like where did the idea come from? And then how, when did you decide to take your particular take of all the different Jesus that you've met, your own biography being a way you kind of uh, come back to Jesus in a sense? Oh gosh. Well, I did not start out to write a book about Jesus. As a matter of fact, that's been a kind of thing that I always thought I, I would leave to my friends Uh, who are like New Testament scholars, you know, people with actual credentials to write a book about Jesus. And, 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 you know, with being a person who was trained in religious studies, I'm actually kind of sensitive to those things. Mm -hmm. So, so I don't take on topics that I don't feel like I have some level of ability to write on thoughtfully. 
So, so Jesus was always on kind of a side side topic for me. But what happened was. I had been for a couple years, mostly out of attending the Wild Goose Festival here in North, you know, in North Carolina, not far from where I live, about an eight hour drive. The there, you know, there's so many people who no longer are comfortable with church and they, they come from a lot of different traditions. There are mainliners who just are kind of through with it. There are lots of people who used to be evangelicals who don't want to go to church anymore or who are looking for some new church. And for, for the longest times, as, as I listen to folks um, and they, they were really working on, excuse me, they were working on issues of sort of putting back, together theological pieces after they had been through some initial stages of what everybody calls deconstruction. I thought, well, you know, I'd like to write a a handbook for them Mm -hmm. and just sort of a guide to theology beyond church. And so I suggested that to my publisher. They loved the idea. And I had laid out that entire book. That entire book is literally in outline form here in my office. And I started writing in the summer of 2019, and I just didn't know which chapter I should start with. Should I begin with talking about the Bible? Should I talk about the end times? Should I talk about death? I mean, I I was really going to handle a lot of big sort of theological topics and try to do it in a way that was, I think, signature work for me, kind of warm and inviting and creative and giving people freedom to come to some new conclusions about these things. So I, so I thought, hmm, the easiest chapter to write in this book is going to be about Jesus. And so I thought that's where I'll start. And I started and I wrote within a short period of time, some somewhere up to about 70 or 80 pages. And <laughs> it was when I got to that many pages, I thought, uh oh! If I'm writing a single chapter about Jesus and it's going to be a hundred pages long, I I think I'm writing the Church Dogmatics, not a shorthand book to Christian Christianity post religion. And uh, so I called my publisher and I said, "This is what's going on." And they said, "Well, maybe you just need to talk to your editor," which I thought was kind of hilarious. Okay, you're going to cut out sixty pages of what I've just written. Um, <laughs> and we we did have a conversation, and it came clear to me that I was really interested in writing a book about Jesus. And the more I talked to my editor back that summer, the more I thought, I I felt nervous still about the academic credential of it. And I thought, well, you know, I, I actually do have something to say about Jesus. And it doesn't come from the fact that I have a PhD in New Testament studies, but it comes from my own life. And And that really, I think for any Christian, there is a certain kind of gravitas. There's a certain kind of confident expertise we should be able to bring, any Christian should be able to bring to talking about Jesus, to sharing our stories about Jesus. And I thought it would be a gift to model um, talking about Jesus from personal experience. And then, of course, because I, I... I preach all the time and I do study church history and I know lots about theology um, is that I could weave that stuff into my experience as a way of introducing people to some new theological ideas. So that's where it came from. It was going to be an entirely different project. It started birthing itself, which makes me absolutely crazy when that happens when I'm writing a book because it's happened more than once. And um, we just went from there and I was nervous the whole time I was writing that book. Well, you know, one of the things that when you when you said you wanted to bring your tone and also your own experience to it and it kind of function as a model for people uh, figuring out, you know, Christianity after whatever we just got Christianity rid of after or, religion. Hey, yeah. <laughs> great title that, for a book. Oh, actually, we should write that down. Um <laughs> Uh, you know, one of the things, uh, it, even in uh, working with people in the systematic theology class, and then they're like, yeah, but I don't know if I know everything or I don't know enough to really talk and all that kind of thing. One of the things I love about your book is, yeah, every Christian is the authority for their own encounter with God. And you want to know what's thoroughly fascinating when you talk to anybody? 
like yeah you 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 know american church history and like it, it, as a professional but you also know diana's experience of faith and i think the way in which the authority you have to share and tell your own story vulnerably and the way your encounter with jesus has evolved and changed and morphed over time um that when you're setting that alongside also the gifts and skills you have as a historian and as an excellent communicator which not all academics know how to do um I think it's a, it's a permission slip to both any Christian or someone who may not use that word but wants to figure out how to free Jesus, right, along mm-hmm. with scholars who um, are so often hesitant to tell the very biography that animates their uh, their work, right? So just in inter- any – I've done, I don't know, like 20 interviews, you know, about a Christology. I'm pretty sure most of the people interviewed me wouldn't understand, and they were like, but – I'm going to have him on. He has a podcast. And almost all the time I end up telling the stories, which why I wrote the book that does not tell those stories in it. And people find that interesting. I'm like, yeah, but this was for an academic press. So I didn't put that in there. You know, so, <laughs> does that make sense? Like, I feel like it's permission in both the context because you're such a, I don't know, a hybrid scholar and communicator, both for the, the, the generation of people figuring out, like faith after religion and for academics trying to figure out what do we do with what we've been given and how do we contribute it? Yeah. I think that, excuse me, I I got a little bit of an allergy going today. I think, Um, I think, I think you're exactly right is that I've known so many interesting people in academia over the years and a lot of people, especially people in Jesus scholarship have very interesting stories. You know, I think of friends and colleagues, you know, who grew up fundamentalism, fundamentalists and then rejected it. And yet they still were trying to figure things out and they wound up going to seminary and graduate school and wrestling with the text over a lifetime and, and their own experience came into that mix and help to shape them as the scholars they are. And that would include everybody from like, you know, Bart Ehrman, who doesn't go to church. And if he does, he does it kind of more culturally for like holidays and stuff. But, you know, he grew up fundamentalist and he just came to reject it all and and all the supernatural elements of Christianity. He sort of wrote his way out of Christianity, but he still writes about Jesus and he does it in provocative and really interesting and powerful ways that I actually love to read Bart's book uh, books. I feel like I'm kind of reading the spiritual journey of a truly post-Christian soul. And then you have somebody like, you know, Dom Crossan, who was a monk in Ireland and has a huge long story about his relationship with the bishop and the Catholic church and coming to America and getting married and everything else, or, or Amy Jill Levine, who's Jewish, uh, but nevertheless winds up writing about Jesus or Mark, the late Marcus Bork, who was a really good friend of mine. And what I find myself, what I always found myself to be um, in my friendship with Marcus was um almost like a sort of a younger sister to him in certain kinds of ways where he knew the scholarship and he loved it. Um, but there was this other thing for him and it was always about experientialism and mysticism. And he really, I know few scholars who could talk about uh, their spiritual experiences of God with quite as much depth as as Marcus could. He didn't do it all the time, but when you got him to that conversation, it was extraordinary. Mm-hmm. So, so I've been lucky enough to know really interesting people and a lot of people who aren't that well known, uh, just colleagues, people I've worked with um, through the years. And, and um, I think the world would be richer if yeah. people knew the stories that were behind uh, the way they approach their subjects in the classroom or the sermons they preach or the articles they've written. Because often that's, that's in some ways, it's fuel mm-hmm. you know, for, for, for their ideas. And we, we can never separate a person's ideas about a subject from their experience of the subject in their own lives. Yeah. So when you talk about the story behind it, um, you recently... Uh, in your newsletter uh, from the cottage, which everyone should sign up for if they're not, um, it, it, that you talk about 
they're actually a story and a narrative running through your last series of books that start with religion after Christianity. And then you see it in grounded and gratitude and freeing Jesus. Um, when you're thinking of like all the different things that are erupting, right. in religion, be it like uh, a COVID uh, starting to wrestle more deeply with racism to like, even the stuff with the <laughs> Southern Baptist convention this week. And, uh, there's so many elements of things going on that we're processing um, what, uh, maybe tell us that big story you were hoping to do. And because you've been attending to those types of questions and themes, uh, when you look back, what were the things you were, you're like, wow, well, I, I didn't anticipate this being the case or, or, or shocked by, and what were the things like, I told you so. Diana wants to say, I told you so. I have done that a little bit of that re recently. <laughs> and I, I feel bad. No, I don't. Nobody ever feels bad for saying I told you so. Um, but even you can though they, pretend you feel bad. That's right. You do, you have to. It's sort of. Diana it's feels bad. It's not. That's right. She doesn't want to completely gloat. <laughs> but she has a right to. Uh I feel like I do in certain cases. <laughs> um, one of them was actually this week uh, the, with the Southern Baptist Convention. I had literally been talking for 15 years in speeches on the road and occasionally mentioned in books and articles that for that it, liberal churches weren't the only ones who were declining, but that conservative churches were declining as well. And the I'd always use the example of the Southern Baptist Convention because I had the, I knew this guy who worked inside the statistics office of the Southern Baptist Convention. And even when the Southern Baptist Convention was claiming that they had 18 million members, my friend who was over in that office told me that if those, half of those people, he said, were on an FBI watch terrorist watch list, the government couldn't find them. And so, and so the idea that the Southern Baptist Convention was so huge and that they weren't just experiencing decline, he literally let me in on a secret that he said it was a total lie, you know, that they were struggling too. And so those statistics have come out a lot more in recent, recent years, especially this last week. They finally are talking about the fact that they had the biggest decline in the last really three years that they've had since 1960 and uh it's kind of stunning so anyway that was my big uh how uh, i tweeted that how long have i been saying this in lectures i wanted the world to know but um well i i i responded to it and then somehow oh, did you? got in a in a i got a friend that i went to undergrad with at a small baptist school uh for undergrad who's now a southern baptist minister oh my and he explained to me how they lost all these numbers do you want to guess what the real cause of uh, the Southern Baptist decline was? They haven't been faithful enough to true doctrine. Yeah, but you know what they got sidetracked on? Critical race theory. Yes. You know what ruined <laughs> the Southern Baptist Convention? And Critical I, race theory. <laughs> yeah, well, the, yeah. They he asked hypothetically, and I was, and I said, uh, Trump idolatry, and uh, and he goes, no. We have a bunch of CRT sympathizers. Yeah. And I was like, I know African-Americans who think that the SBC has millions of CRT sympathizers that are ruining the church. And um, uh, I've, I've been unfriended. Oh, so I'm so sorry. I, I, I know. encourage that to happen. I <laughs> I was like, I, I don't know what to tell you, but okay. But the big picture. Yeah. The big picture is, <laughs> was, uh, let me, uh, I can turn around and get the other book. Yeah. 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 So the thing that I wrote in uh, the cottage was about this book that we were joking about the title about a little while ago. It kind of, it, it's a very pretty cover. It always has been a pretty mm. cover. Christianity after religion. It kind of is shiny. It's, it's nice. Um, and Christianity After Religion was written in 2010, early 2011. It came out in early 2012. And this particular book had two purposes. And one was to alert my friends. By that time, I was on the road a lot. I was working with lots of denominations. I'd already written uh, five other books about congregational vitality and sort of the future of church. And um, so, so I was becoming pretty well known with that question, those sets of questions. And I wanted to alert my friends to the fact of 
the the trend lines. And what was becoming obvious to me, as well as other people who pay attention to trend lines in sociology of religion, other other fields in religious studies, was that the membership statistics were begin in the United States were beginning to resemble kinds of the trend lines that we had seen about religious disaffiliation in Europe in the 1950s and 1960s. And you know, people have talked about Europe for years and years and years as being post-Christian or a secular society with sort of a remnant of Christian memory, et cetera, et cetera. And everyone would always say that the United States is the exception, that was part of American exceptionalism, because we were so highly religious and that we were always going to be far more Christian than any other country in our uh, economic and developmental sort of space. And it was beginning to look like right after the turn of the millennium that that was not true, um, that the United States was becoming far more pluralistic and even having these sorts of potentially large communities of people who were atheists, agnostics, humanists, secular secular people, um, and certainly people who were then calling themselves spiritual but not religious. And so I wanted to alert pe- I wanted to alert folks who I worked with, my fa- most faithful readers, um, to these trends and let them know what was coming. And that way they could, I thought, do better planning. You know. <laughs> You know, sort of adjust their denominational missions, rethink their visions. Um, which, which we have to admit, mainline Protestants have done such a great job at that. Yeah, they've been terrible at it. Uh, and it makes me so sad. Um, although I think individuals have really tried. There are some people who really worked hard on these issues, and it, but the institutions are so lumbering. It's like, it's not like turning around the Titanic, really. It, it's like trying to get a... a a dinosaur to train for uh, the Olympics. I mean, it's it's almost, you can get the Titanic to turn around, but dinosaurs don't win Olympic medals. You know, you're just not going to get uh, a gigantic uh, sort of creature lumbering through a forest that can become a world-class Olympic sprinter. And so, so, so anyhow, these denominations, I would, I, I loved them, I, and I still love them, and I wanted them to do better. So that was a big part of Christianity after religion. But I knew it was not enough to simply warn them about numbers because it's easy to avoid those kinds of things. And so I decided that I would also suggest that there was an emerging shape of Christian community that could adapt to or perhaps even stem the numerical decline and help them to be more faithful um, to their identity. And the emerging shape of what I thought was the future of Christianity is in the center for chapters of Christianity after religion. And I talk about in those chapters um, what it means to belong, what it means to behave, and what it means to believe. And so I t- that and there's nothing new in that you and I know and I'm sure a lot of people who are listening in also know that that's just sort of the classic three um, ways the three sort of windows into understanding what a religion is like you look at those three things how they understand identity belonging how what their practices are like how they behave and then finally the things that they hold to be true about humankind God etc and um, so what they believe. And so we know that. And that's simple stuff that's Religious Studies 101. And, but the, the more provocative part of that sec- section was I suggested that the actual conceptualization of identity, behavior, practice, and believing had, w- was undergoing a transformation And that transformation was around uh, experience that we were shifting away from. And this was sort of basic. I know you've been doing this thing on Charles Taylor. Sort of basic 
really Charles Taylor, is that we were moving away from externally driven, inherited senses of identity practice and I, of personal conviction um, toward uh, self-wrought um, experiential di- questions of all of those things. And so the, the upshot was, I argued that the question around belonging had changed from a question of membership towards relationship. Instead of what do I, what institution do I belong to? What, what do my membership cards look like? Who am I in relationship with? And how do those relationships shape my sense of who I am in the world? And then this, the second question, behavior, changed around um, a shift from externally given rules and procedures, like how do you do this thing, um, toward what are we going to do? And so the shift is from rules to practices, from learning to become an expert in something like, say, Robert's Rules of Order or the polity of a given denomination or some sort of guide towards lifestyle behavior, Baptists. I don't drink, dance, and chew, and I don't go with girls who do. And so, so those are the rules. And people had to become experts at those in order to become good at those traditions. But now the question was, oh, what are we going to do? You know, nobody knew what to do anymore. The rule books didn't seem to work. And so that is a move towards becoming skilled at creating new habits in people, forming character out of re- repetitive actions that relate to a larger story. Like, you know, hmm, maybe we should practice hospitality. Perhaps we should devote our lives to justice. That's very different than a rules orientation. And then the third thing, uh, Behave, believing was was changing up from uh, acceptance of a set of ideas around dogma or creed um, toward an experience, experiential knowing um, is that the ground, and you said it very clearly at the very, at the very beginning of our conversation, the ground shifted toward um, people being able to tell their stories and to be able to narrate the truthfulness that we know in the world. And that that shift, not what do I believe as in I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, but rather how we believe. And that's really what freeing Jesus is all about. It's, it's a, the, the core question is, how can a 60-year-old woman two decades into the 21st century still believe? How does she believe in Jesus? And, you know, after all of this, after the end of Christendom and uh, feminism and post-Holocaust theology and everything else, you know, it's like, how, how does she believe in Jesus? And so that's the story I tell. And, and in the Substack, I, I've, I've, the, the last thing I'll just sort of say towards your question is that after I wrote the blue book, Christianity After Religion, I knew that I needed to dedicate more work to each one of those chapters, the single chapters in the book, which are really kind of good. I went back and I reread them a few weeks ago and they surprised me. Um, I had forgotten there were things in there that I had actually written. And so I went, oh, I, I like that a great idea. And so I, but I did, I went, I, I, so then I decided that my next three books should probably be about uh, belonging, behaving and believing. And so grounded followed Christianity after religion. And that was a book about where God is. And the essential thesis of, of grounded is we find God when we are in relationship with neighbor and nature. And by being in that relationship with the world around us, with creation and with other people in human community. That's how we know God. That's how we find our relationship with God. And then the second book in this series was, well, what behavior uh, needs to be held out um, as a significant, humane and transformative healing practice for the world? And that's when I make the case that gratitude is the prime, I think, one of the primary avenues of optimism and hopefulness to be able to make a difference in the world. I I think that, I think that it is really 
the most transformative, the most radical of all human practices. And um, so, so that was great, the book Grateful. And then what I knew is that the third book in this series, following Christianity After Religion, had to be about belief. And so that's why I was going to write a handbook towards Christian theology, because I wanted to write about how do you believe things. Um, and so I, that's where I started with that question. And how do I believe things became how do I believe this one specific thing? Because I think that um, our understanding of who Jesus is, is one of the things that we hold on to the longest, even though people, even after people leave church. And I think it's also the thing that more liberal church people trip over the most because there are so many wrongheaded and even hurtful notions um, about who Jesus is. And so I wanted to, I wanted to clear that up. So that's been the task. I've been involved in this project of writing these four books now for 12, 13 years. And I think that what has happened for me is that the pathway through this, this project, and I didn't start it on day one. It, it kept growing as I was moving through it. Um, I think it's really been, I think it's the most important work that I could have ever imagined doing. And I, I think it has kept me focused and intellectually creative and innovative and um, it helps, has helped me understand the world just so much better. And, and I'm, I'm actually very proud of these four books. And, mm -hmm. And I think they they say something that is incredibly important for the way that we are living now, but also what potential the future holds uh, for still being Christian. Mm -hmm. No, I I um, it, it, my my experience reading you and then getting to know you is um, that your intuitions are very good, and if I'm if I like, oh, I don't. I think she might be overstating this in Christianity after religion. I mean, I love being religious. <laughs> like there, I mean, there are multiple places where, like, I right. I've just learned to trust your intuition, and I think there's a whole lot of people that do. Um, and you know, one of the uh, things that strikes me, um, looking back at Christianity after religion, and then how that has shaped you know things going forward is that so much of our continued anxiety for people within the church is I think that failure to come to grips with just the shifting religious spiritual landscape that um, like, just think of what questions we ask in surveys and what numbers we keep track of, right? Yeah. Like the assumption is you're, you're either religious if you participate in some congregation on some frequency or you're non-religious if you don't. And I think, one of the beautiful things about after that book, Doing Grounded, is there are people who haven't been in a church in a long time and maybe never go that could read it and go, yeah, this is articulating like what uh, a new a new account of the contemporary spiritual ethos. And there are people that have never left the church and they're like, yeah, that's the most beautiful account of what happens in the liturgy I've ever heard, Diana. Right? Like in, in underneath that is this shift from – that the the biggest religious question post Christendom isn't like w like do you go or not, and then do you go to the right tribe, and now we're going to battle that out. It's like it, is there some narrative and reservoir of meaning that opens you up to something more than kind of the the flattened existence of modernity gone awry. Right. Like and there's all sorts of different ways. Like even the wild goose example, um, you go there and there's like uh a bunch of Episcopalians that keep the hours together in a tent next to like Wiccan Christians and then the Pentecostals that read your spirit. And you can usually tell what part of the church you're in as to which of those three creeps you out the most. Right. Um, <laughs> but like, but I, I would love to hear like how you, like, what is the question you think that drive, like that we should be asking, like if you wanted to get better data and you wanted to understand um our current religious and spiritual climate. Are there particular questions surveyors could ask that are better rather than like, where do you go and how often you go? Um, 
for example, I did a survey of uh, people on my email list. So like I emailed 50,000 people got, you know, most of them, I guess, listen to the podcast uh, in some frequency enough that I get to hijack their inbox. And um, like a third of them go to church every week, you, you know, unless, you know, like there's a real reason. And a third of them never go. Mm-hmm. And then there's like all the things in between. And then like a year or so later, when I I emailed people, I gave a different survey and was trying to figure out like, what, what kind of questions do you ask? Because these are people that listen to a 90 minute conversation like right. with super nerds and not ones normally gifted like you to talk to normal people. <laughs> you know, like I have to edit it. I would never live stream it. You know what I mean? So, like, I feel like there's something going on. Like, what kind of questions are, are you think would be better to really get a grasp of how things are changing? Well, you know, this is actually why I'm not a sociologist of religion is because I could never figure out what to say in a survey. And, you know, for, for 10 years, I served on the board, the founding board of Public Religion Research Incorporated, which has become probably, I think, the most sophisticated uh, research firm in North America on religious questions. And so I'm very good friends with its its president, Robbie, Robbie Jones, Robert P. Jones is his, is his formal name. And he's written a couple of really good books in the last uh, four years on racism and Christianity. And so what I tend to do with th- this kind of question when people ask me is I defer <laughs> to, to Robbie and they've been trying to figure this out. And Robbie has a PhD in, in survey construction and all this kind of stuff. And they've been struggling as have other people with trying to get at what, what it means uh, to be a person of faith in the 21st century, uh, because, you know, you can kind of measure religiosity with those old fashioned questions about church attendance, et cetera. Um, at least you can measure old fashioned religiosity with those old fashioned questions. And you can also sort of measure spirituality. People have gotten a little better at that by ta- by asking people if they've ever had a mystical experience or um, you can ask people, uh, things about what they practice outside of church. You know, the, uh, is there a spiritual dimension to their commitment to say Black Lives Matter? I mean, you can kind of think about ways of doing that, um, but that still lacks that depth of what you're getting at. And, uh, you know, maybe this is part of the reason why I get frustrated even with my own work is that eventually... Uh, my passion is to do exactly what you just explained, is to be able to speak in a meaningful way about Christian Christian theological ideas and the great narratives of the Bible and the life of Jesus, all this Christian stuff, to be able to speak well about that to people who are both post-church and people who are in church, to the people who continue liking that, that one third who who couldn't live without that on a weekly basis, which is, I don't see that as immature or anything that I have no judgment about how people pick on this spectrum. I see both of these choices as perfectly legitimate expressions of contemporary Christianity, whether you do it in your garden or and, or with a group of friends uh, on a protest march or whether you are doing it in a liturgy that has been set or whether you do it in both. I, 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 I'm not taking sides um, because I think that all of those things can express the same impulse towards these questions about these shifts around relational belonging around getting to practices that create a more just and healed world and toward um, the primacy of, not the primacy, how about the authority that each one of us bears in witnessing to the truthfulness of the universe. Um, And so, so the uh, so so I don't know how to measure that. I really don't. Well, and you, something. Go ahead. That, oh, something just popped in my mind when you said like measuring it. I think part of that. Is, I mean, one 
the multiplicity, right? Like of, I don't know, mm-hmm. uh, symbolic languages and rituals and ha- habits that are connected to someone engaging a depth dimension, right? Or of some sort uh, is, is pluralism, but like under there's a pluralism to it, but you, Alistair McIntyre talked about how, um, one of the outcomes of the West cultivating a kind of uh, the the potential for a robust life apart from an inherited superstructure is right. that there's the privatization of the good life, that modernity, because it recognizes diversity and beautiful lives lived in different religious traditions at first, right? Now, oh, the Catholics count in America. Now, Judeo-Christian, or, you know, you start expanding right. it, and then you realize your atheist neighbors are better human than you, and then, it like, all bets are off, right? And so recognizing that pluralism for a real good reason in the West has meant that the public discourse has privatized questions about the good life, about a beauty and goodness in ways that – um, before, when you have a shared symbolic structure of any religious tradition or a philosophy or whatever, then there are uh, there's like a mythopoetic container, a yearly rhythm and rituals and stuff that then frame life transitions, tragedies, joys, and all that kind of stuff. But and, and so the question of the good life happens in a community with shared uh, uh, framing stories, right? But when it gets privatized. Um, in some sense, that allows for a beautiful diversity. And the other, the individual now is responsible for something a human has never been responsible for for almost any part of history. Most humans didn't hang out with every religious tradition on their street and none. Most of right. them, like, and if they did, they were getting them to join or pretend they joined, right? Like, yeah. And so there's this sense that, uh, like, we are in a different place and we haven't even learned to how to ask the right questions and it's uncomfortable because we want to affirm the pluralism and and the possibility of fulfilled life in a diverse perspectives but we also don't want a vacuous public square where i think we're at a point where the public square's vacuousness is uh coming back to bite us right yeah, I think that the the question that you asked, or that what you described there about the about the the moral the moral individual, the person who is pursuing the good life, and that in the world that we've created, largely in the West, that has been pressed toward, we, by by pluralism. There there are. The, the sort of de- the demands of pluralism have made us have asked made us ask new questions about the nature of the good life and how, how we live that. Um, but those questions, as you well know, those are not new questions. I mean, we can go back to ancient philosophy and there are people making arguments where they're saying that, you know, the, the dairy farmer and the baker woman um, all are perfectly capable of of the good life and, and that people in very um, modest circumstances uh, can be people of good character and live a kind of nobility. And, and so that idea that came out of sort of Greco Roman culture, certainly, um, you know, that extended into the American revolution. That was a really important part of the ideas, the be- I think some of the best ideas of America that Thomas Jefferson wrote about. And, you know, that nobility wasn't dependent upon wealth. And, and, and of course, if it didn't depend upon wealth, it wouldn't depend upon slavery. And, and, yet, and he wrote so philosophically ab- about the possibility of just the regular person living the good life in a sense that was even better than any European noble ever could. And so that, that, that humble kind of approach to character was really part of the Enlightenment project, and we've inherited it. Uh, and so, so it was there, and it got messed up, uh, obviously, because of slavery, 
And uh, because I think of other forms of wealth construction and the construction of class that undermined, I think, the idealism of individual nobility um, back in the early, back in the late 18th century, actually. And so, so, so I would argue that it isn't so much pluralism that has created the circumstance as rather inheriting a tradition of the moral person in community and the vision of everyone being able to do that and there being a kind of community of ennobled souls um, that we inherited that sort of tradition philosophically through time. Um, but in the 21st century, I think that corporate culture is the most destructive thing. I think oh, that, yeah. I think that it's possible that we could have, and certainly other cultures have tried to have certain kinds of civic rituals that re repristinate our commitment to that. And one of the things that I actually loved about Obama, even though I know people have a lot of issues with Obama and his ties to more corporate democratic kinds of stuff is that at least um, linguistically Obama had a real vision of this and he he in all of his speeches cre created a kind of a new history a new a new historical and philosophical narrative of the good life that included Stonewall, that included the civil rights movement, that included Seneca Falls, that included Sojourner Truth, that included Harriet Tubman, and pointed towards this sort of large cast of American characters, white, black, Asian, gay, straight, you name it, who did live noble lives, who in effect were American saints. And that I think he opened our imaginations towards um, the possibility of a sort of ritual, liturgical, public construction of how we might engage that tradition in the 21st century. Um, you, can I ask you a follow up? Because you, because yeah. I, in one sense, that you have that feature. The Obama told our story back to us, right? Where it was more beautiful in light of, uh, I don't know, a deeper account of the good life, right? Like as a community, but yet it was also, you had the feature you named before that are, I don't know, the, the corporatist hijacking of our lives um, it creates this context that makes it, really difficult to ever get around to whatever your particular con conception of the good life is, even if you acknowledge and let the diversity in, because um, the modern subject is always having to gain. You always have to be getting more or you're losing, right? Like there's this That's internalization correct. where the, um, so the good life becomes something that's always ahead of you. And so you have to get more, right? Like you have to, uh, uh, Rosa, we're reading, we'll read this in the group in week five or six, the, our secular age group. He talks about that modernity is always trying to make things more attainable, accessible and available. Um, and that drive you see just in like uh, all you do for your kid, just to turn them into a person that has their thing where they feel fulfilled and all the networks and all the things to get, uh, you know, to succeed. And you're always running because you know that I can't opt out of the system that drives me to burnout. And the whole yeah. time I'm doing it, I'm signing my kid up for it. It's just, there is no society where this logic of, of constant growth isn't there. And so then you look at this beautiful questions any religious tradition gives you or the Stoics or whatever. And there's this vision of the good life. You're like, that is so good. So right. once I know I'm stable through my retirement, I'm able to own a home. I know my kids can go to college. Like eventually I'll get to a place where I can wake up, read the paper, have a cup of coffee and volunteer and, or maybe not, but at least on vacation, I will have a culture out. You know, like the, I think the, Part of the problem is 
that we haven't a, look, attended deeply to the way our culture is so shaped by the necessary drive for growth and the anxiety that the, we then internalize. Um, you know, I, 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 th- I believe that. And I, I think you've just articulated it perfectly, especially the way it appears in the literature. Um, the, I've been thinking about it slightly differently in recent months. And that is, I think it's less about gain, which becomes about greed. And I, I, and I've written about greed too. You know, I, I can't remember. I wrote a recent Substack about Gordon Gecko in the age of greed. It could have even been in the the piece that I wrote about Christianity after religion. Um, but that that drive of achievement, the greed, the billionaire, you know, sort of worldview, et cetera. Um, see, what happens with that is we're still essentially placing the blame on individuals. Is we're saying that somehow individuals who are pursuing this kind of rabbit trail are bad people um, because they are caught up in this sinful vision. And even us, you know, we, we feel it. And in effect, the, the, the need for that gain um, cuts into our ability to live the good life. But, you know, it's, I don't think it's gain as much as it is security. Oh yeah, it's like securing your place because you know people are always getting cut out. Well, I I think it's partly that because see again that's putting it on the individual. I have to secure a place for me and my family because somebody else will get in line, take our chair from this table. So there's a sense where you know there's a limited universe and we have to have our space and a space to keep our children um, at that table, or else we know what will happen because we see what will happen. When we open our door, we drive through our cities or we turn on television and we see we try to hide the poor, but the poor are our moral example not to become them. What I really think the security is, is not just that. I think it is actual security. I think it is the need for perpetual military presence to protect corporate structures. And. And so security is not just, oh, me and my need to sit at this table so that my children stay fed, but security is the actual protection of these structures by the by giving our wealth, our treasure, you know, our treasure, our time, our talent to creating a hedge of sort of military per- protection around what we have so that it can't be destroyed. And and all of that was brought to a head on 9-11. Is that 9-11 was about, and, and you never, I, I wish I would have heard more churches talk about this. You know, it, it was so easily circumvented into anti-Muslim stuff. Uh, but what? It, why did people attack us on 9-11? And why did they pick the World Trade Center? You know, it, it, it was about money. And it was about the fact that our military was in countries where they, they shouldn't have been protecting streams of wealth in order to provide security for wealthy Western nations to become wealthier. We were, it, it, it's literally actual physical security. We're trying to protect ourselves from the fear of our own destruction. And the corporations, of course, need that because if human beings are destroyed, they don't have a market. They don't have people to buy their products. They, they, they actually need physical security in order to ensure markets. And so I think what's driving all of this, that our incapacity to live the good life is fear, period. And that fear is, you know, I mean, you pointed it out, the fear in certain ways is illogical, but in other ways it's perfectly logical. Why do you want to, cl- why did, why did Trump win by wanting to close the borders? Because people are afraid of huge numbers of people crossing the border into the United States and upsetting the flow of markets and market goods. Mm-hmm. And, and so 
so it's not just greed. I want to keep this for myself, but it's actual, I am afraid of anything that would threaten the very existence of these markets or this wealth. And we were, we are going to huge lengths to protect ourselves from fear, to provide mm -hmm. security, security, not greed. Security is the God of the West. Mm -hmm. And, and so that immediately causes horrible problems because if you will do anything to stem the fear, you will violate almost any moral code book that there is. And oh, it yeah. also it also means that individuals ha possess the power to resist it. Because if you in your own life refuse to live in fear, well, then you are outside. You are functionally, you're then functioning as an outsider to the culture of fear. The more hopeful, optimistic, loving that you can be, the more you are actually creating a life of resistance to security. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, optimism, hopefulness, joy, all of these things, they give you the capacity to laugh in the face of fear. They give you the capacity to open your doors to strangers. They give you the capacity to accept what comes as a result of making choices. And so you get really amazing characters like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who, whose last works while he's in prison actually ring with both prophecy against this kind of culture and joy. Yeah. And so, so, so this is what I, this is, the, I am, I am more convinced than ever that our capacity to sing, our capacity to dance, our capacity to express joy, our capacity to see a hopeful future, our capacity to embrace the good life, that is our resistance. And um, it doesn't mean we do it perfectly. Everybody, nobody does it perfectly. There is always temptation, the garden, the, 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 the evil of the garden always yawns in front of us. Um, but perhaps the evil of the garden always yawns behind us <laughs> and is always calling us back towards that fear. Um, but we can be different people. And so, so that's what I think it is. I think it's fear and I think it's wrapped up in security. I think that's the sin of contemporary culture. Well, uh, I didn't know we were signing up for a revival, Diana. Are we ready to, <laughs> we will walk the aisle now. Like, um, <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, I just want to talk about Jesus and see, this is why I think Jesus is so important I, is that Jesus is the primary example of living this way. You know, it's like, if you don't have Jesus, you, you know, you're a Christian person, you've cut yourself off from the greatest model in all of our history to live free of fear. Mm -hmm. Even when the whole oppressive system comes crashing down on you, and creates the worst possible circumstance for your life, takes your life. Mm -hmm. Jesus and then those post-resurrection accounts, of course, are about joy beyond fear, about joy beyond death. They can take everything. Security doesn't matter in a world that you live in the joy of God. Well, you know, one of the one of the reasons I love the Jesus book um, and, you know, thinking of it, in the context of, you know, your last four books, that it's the answer to, you know, what do we do with the whole believing thing, right? Like if before it was this big cutoff, like, and every denomination and tribe had their list of beliefs, right? You go back to this multiple, like a multiplicity of testimonies. Like in a sense, there's like this big tent with like every chapter is a different Diana in this big story of Diana, one member of the body of Christ, and she gives her testimony through time, and you would never say to it, because it's literally you each time, well, is this one true if this one's true? Because I'm not exactly sure, right? Like, you don't say that about your own story, and yet there's a multiplicity, uh, this diversity of testimonies there. And I think that, you know, one of the striking things about that is – 
um, it reminds me of this passage where uh, Whitehead, which uh, uh, said that you know the brilliance of Christianity is that it doesn't come with a metaphysic and a set of beliefs. It comes with a story where the most pr- profound thing was the execution of a righteous one. And then every generation has to ask the big questions we've always asked. Like, why is something rather than nothing? What is good? What is beautiful? Like, what is justice? All those things. But it begins by telling that particular story that, that you know, necessarily resist certain kinds of answers. Um, and, and that, your Jesus book, isn't a Christology. It's just all the Jesuses you've known, I think, is a, is a rather profound invitation. Well, I, I, I think that it is um, a book that invites people to, to see these, these things really kind of entirely differently. I mean, I, I might want to, you know, uh, sort of lean into the idea that it could be an experiential or memoir Christology, as it were. Uh, but no, it's not Christology in any kind of formal sense. But what I do, what I love about it and what I loved about writing it is I realized that my first theological understandings came before I could even read. And um, the first chapter about Jesus as friend is basically the experience of pre-literate Diana um, in coming to know Jesus. And because I was born in the middle part of the 20th century in the United States, you know, and when the population was still, you know, largely churched, even if not, you know, faithful and you know, people went to church, people talked about Christianity, people had a sort of a relative kind of Christian thing going on in public space. And, and so it would have been, it was an unusual life uh, in the early 1960s of a Christian person that didn't hear the name of Jesus. I mean, you, you just did. And so those were all my first experiences were hearing that name and then trying through the, my childhood imagination to process the stories that were being attached to that person. And the wonder of a Jesus who could live easily in the manger scene and in the, my Barbie house <laughs> and in the woods across the street from my house. And, and that there was sort of this, this really, you know, to use the sociological language, enchanted universe that children inhabit. And Jesus was just there with me. And so to take that voice and to remember that I, I mean, I loved remembering that. I was writing that chapter during the pandemic, if you think about it. When I'm cut off from all my friends, I'm writing about my friend, Jesus. It was it was very healing and very powerful um, to go back in my memory to those early days. And then to not only write about it as if I was four and reimagining the universe, reconstructing the universe that I lived in then, but then to take the 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 sort of wonder of that into my 60 year old voice and reflect on that theologically and put it in conversation with the Bible and put it in conversation with church history and with current events. And so, so that's how each chapter works. You know, I reflect on the chapter as if I were four or 10 or 14 or 20 or 20 nine or 40 Mm -hmm. and um, talk about each one of those different Jesuses along the way and to both recapture the wisdom of my lived experience and to then put it in conversation with sort of larger experience out of the tradition. So that's the, that's the book. And I think that, you know, when our conversation about the good life, um, you know, I think that there's a real sub theme throughout the book that is about my my reaching for my struggle uh, to live the good life um, in as Christian a fashion as I possibly can, and to pursue a life of love and a life of healing, um, which for me then is also a life of justice um, in this world. Uh, without being consumed of questions around heaven and hell. Okay, so I'm 
our detour down uh, Christianity after religion and how all four books been. I didn't get to quite a bit of questions, so I'm going to ask you three of them. Okay, I'll try and to. You be don't really have fast. to, and but I'm not allowed to have an opinion about anything you say. Uh, well, well, I will, but I won't say it. <laughs> I was going to say what? Oh, that's new. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean it's a. Yeah. Anyway, I'm gonna ask you these three questions. So I okay. don't want to. I want to go long, but also like some of them are real fun, and I I was like, oh, I, if they ask a question and I actually want to know the answer, then I'm, I'm like, well, I definitely want to ask this question. All right. So one is when you when you were when you're working on the Jesus book, was there a particular uh, uh, narrative in the gospel that you came back to, or a parable, or, or anything where all of a sudden it has a new meaning and you, you cling to it like uh, the whole Jesus book. Was there a particular part of the Jesus story in scripture that came alive again? Um, I would say there were, there were several that, and this is just a quick detour of the things that meant the most to me. Um, one the, the talking about the friendship chapter, I just adore talking about that because I had not realized what a powerful theme that is throughout the whole old and new testaments. And I think it really is kind of an underplayed um, theological idea that actually has a lot of cultural attractiveness in the 21st century. And that, sadly enough, I think most contemporary Christians kind of look down their noses at. And and, and indeed, there was a there was actually just this week um, a a mostly nice review of a. Uh, of freeing Jesus on Amazon. I, I was, it was gracious. It was thoughtful. Uh, but the guy who wrote it literally said, well, that chapter on friend where the book starts, most of the men in my group didn't like it. But when I took it home and was reading it with my wife, my wife and kids really thought it was neat. And I just went, oh, Lord, have mercy. Here is this guy actually living out what I say in the book is that white male Christians actually look down their noses at the theological idea of friendship, whereas women and children have often practiced it very deeply, and it is meaningful to women and children. And so it was kind of sexist, and and, I, and I'm sorry to that nice reviewer, but you need to go back and revisit that. Um, so anyway, so that was a really uh, meaningful uh, part of the book. Another important part was realizing that um, in the Gospels, the thing that Jesus is referred to most often by the people who knew him is by, they called him friend or teacher. Um, and, and that word teacher is the word rabbi. And that in the first century, rabbi was a new word. It was basically a word that was coming out of first century emergent Judaism uh, to describe a wise leader who gathered a group of disciples around him or her and interpreted the, it was almost always hymns, but uh, interpreted the tradition, the Torah, in new ways through storytelling. And so that Jesus was part of that movement of these first century rabbis wandering around ancient Palestine is pretty cool. And the fact that that's how Jesus' friends referred to him. And at Easter, for example, when I was reading the John account of the resurrection this year, Mary turns around in the garden, Mary Magdalene turns around the garden and sees Jesus, doesn't immediately recognize him. And then after a short little conversation, she looks at him and, and she says, Rabboni. And the word of recognition is the word teacher. And there were some early Christian fathers who, who took that to mean that Mary Magdalene still didn't get it, that women still didn't understand the power of resurrection, you know, is that if she really understood what had happened in the resurrection, she would have called him savior or, you know, some, uh, Christos, you know, or whatever. And, and um, yet she didn't, she called him teacher. But I see, I think that the early church fathers got that wrong. I think that the power of that story is not that Mary Magdalene doesn't understand, that she understands, is that the Jesus who is standing with her is the same Jesus who has been her teacher. And that teacher was holy, Rabboni was holy, that it was a gateway to the knowledge of God. 
And so, so anyway, I just think that that was really something. So those are two of the things and they appear fairly early in the book, uh, which were very important to me. Um, I think people can kind of get uh, later in the book, my, um, my passion and my ability to finally f- uh, sort of recover um, a Jesus who is primary the way, primarily the way of love. And, and I think that the, the gospel that I use the most throughout the book would probably be the gospel of John, although Matthew would probably be a close second. And those are sort of my two, um, the two gospels I lean in most deeply um, at this point of my life. I, I love Matthew. Um, I didn't for a long time, and now it's probably my favorite, but John is a close second. Well, um, see, I'm not going to make a comment. I even had a following. Like, if anyone wants to go see what Kierkegaard does with the teacher in response to uh, the resurrection, um, I was going to mention that. But oh my gosh, uh, now I got to go look. I don't see, <laughs> but I'm not saying it because I want to know there are two different questions okay. that came in on the same topic. And so uh, one said, um, I'm really trying to get, I'm trying to free Jesus. I got a lot of Jesus baggage. I don't want to give the Jesus baggage unnecessarily to my kids. Uh, any advice? Um, and the other was, I, I don't have uh, a church in my small town um, that, can, that can be a community of Jesus followers that don't have a whole lot of things that are triggering, burdensome, and were traumatic for me. Uh, advice on finding a community uh, to follow Jesus. Do you go? Do you set boundaries? And then there's a bunch of examples. But both of them, I think, are uh, you know looking uh, you know looking for wisdom from someone they trust on. Like, how do you share Jesus after Christianity in a community with when you're parenting? Um, I kind of did it by the, you know, the seat of my pants. My daughter is uh, 23 now. And so I'm not entirely convinced that I did it um, perfectly by any stretch of the imagination. But I I was committed to a couple of, of things. And I think that that's when what parents have to hold up is to really say, okay, what what is it about this story that I absolutely believe to be truthful? What is the most beautiful part of the story? And how do I communicate that to my children? And for me, um, there were, there was, there was one thing that was the most beautiful and the most truthful thing about the Gospels, and and it, I communicate it in freeing Jesus, and that is quite simple: love God and love your neighbor. That Christianity is a way of love. It's a way of love that Jesus embodied and through friendship to, to the world and through his teachings and through um, those those crazy events that we that are so hard to interpret about the death and resur- his death and resurrection. It's about love, 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 period, full stop. And and if it becomes about anything else, you're probably sending your kids down the wrong path. And so so that, that's what I held out. And um, for my for my daughter, um, that really uh, was very effective. <laughs> she wound up majoring in religious studies at the University of Virginia. Of all the crazy things, she was she was the only person who was sort of like the most out progressive pro-gay Christian in most of her religious studies classes, which were haunted by evangelicals of various sorts who were either trying to escape the rest of UVA by majoring in religious studies or trying to make sense of evangelicalism by learning something about theology. And so my daughter, she would literally call me up in the middle of classes or text, she would text me and say, someone's talking about gay stuff. What verses should I quote? <laughs> It was hilarious. We we actually had a, our relationship deepened through her her whole experience in university, and um, so so she she really got it, and she just kind of is continually astonished by the fact that there there's anyone in the world who calls themselves a Christian and acts in unloving ways, and you know she she got that when she was six. She understood. Mm-hmm. She understood hypocrisy about that when she was six years old, and so so I so I say you know just just keep going with that. You know you you never go wrong 
teaching a kid that God is about love. Mm -hmm. Just, I I mean, you can go wrong if you teach them that God is about love. And because of that, God is going to punish sinners in hell and burn eternally. Well, Diane, love sometimes looks like eternal conscious torment. You don't yeah. know that, but that's because the love's also holy. Right. And you nothing says holy like, like eternal conscious torment. That, that's exactly right. Like people burning, frying in hell forever. Um, and so and you that's know, not even a good enough description of how bad it can be. <laughs> so so uh, treat love with common sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, okay. So last question. So, last so that's question. A- Oh, oh, real quick though, the oh. person who can't find community. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, I would. See, say, I was trying to cut myself no, off from derailing. I'm, I'm sorry, but I really want to have that person. Oh no. Um, I feel like that's such an important question. Um, it's really hard, and you're going to have to figure out if there is a community that you can be in and set boundaries. Um, unless you're a really strong person, I doubt it. And so, what I would do is just you know find some friends who are kind of spiritual and who share values that you have in whatever town that you live in, um, who may not be associated with a church and, you know, sort of take your faith with you to the coffee shop or to wherever those people gather and just be with other humans and enjoy the presence of God where two or three are gathered, even if it is outside of a church. And then avail yourself to whatever theological resources you can through the internet, and through occasional communal gatherings, like going to something uh, like the Wild Goose Festival. Or I have had friends for years who have gone up to Holden Village in Washington who are Lutherans and go there for two weeks or a month in the summer and sort of fill their souls. Um, or go to Iona in Scotland. If you, if you have any capacity to invest in that sort of travel to communal gatherings. Um, that can be one of the best investments of your finances that you can make in a year. All right. Last question. Yes. Favorite Jesus movie. Oh, wow. I'm fine. This is what stumps you. Is like out of all the things that gets yeah. done. Isn't that funny? I I kind of love Jesus Christ Superstar, which is probably not a big surprise to people. And I think I mostly love it because it came out when I was 10 or 12. I, and I I just love the music and the album. Um you know, I would play over and over and over again when I was a young teenager and the music just meant a lot to me and trip has disappeared. Maybe he's going to go and play Jesus Christ superstar, which would be awesomely cool. Um, so I, I think that's my favorite Jesus movie. There he comes. Sorry. I was, I started coughing and. Oh, (laughs) I, Oh no. I'm sorry. I was like, I know. I and I I'm had the too, I'm too well I had these bubble waters, these carbonated waters, <laughs> and I ran out like just a minute ago. And then I was like, I'm starting to cough and I'm getting paranoid. And of course, <laughs> it's the only answer that's under six minutes, Diana. <laughs> the, the, the the singing though does make Jesus Christ superstar like allure of but what what about jesus of montreal i think that's like the most underrated one you know i've never seen that one actually Re- okay so i, I hadn't terrible. come out yet on the podcast but i interviewed helen bond the i mean new testament historical jesus scholar and we were talking about jesus films and she's like yeah i i haven't watched that one and oh well, glad i'm not alone then no she's head of school here at the university of edinburgh so i i was like well, my DVD copy doesn't work on any UK DVD players, which I don't understand why certain DVDs don't work in different countries. That seems weird because they're I know, DVDs. They have codes in them. Yeah. I'm like, all right, I'd share it with you, but you can steal it. Um, you want to know um, Marcus Borgen, 
John Dominic Crossan had the same favorite Jesus film. Do you want to guess what it was? I have no idea. I never heard them answer this question. I'm really fascinated. The Life of Brian. Oh, my gosh. Well, what a great answer. They both said it. And I asked them it separately. And I was like, I come on. Like, I out of all of it. And uh, Marcus goes, well, I just find the the uh, it, it's able to bring up uh, the tensions and the complications with the imperial uh, issues so well. And then how the apocalyptic Jewish context w- would have really like, you know, he's going through this whole thing. And then the like the origin of any religious group, like when it goes to the holy, you know, the holy sandal. And of course he would say it's not the holy sandal. Like you're always having to deal with this in such a rich time with, you know, going on. And John Dominic Cross, and I asked him and, and he go, and I was like, really? I was like, that's what, that's what Marcus said. He goes, oh, I know he like it, but he ta- he answers this question way too seriously. I just laugh the whole movie from the time he says, blessed are the cheese makers. <laughs> and <laughs> And, oh my god. But he says I it, you know, it. with his like Irish accent. Yes, and, it's perfect. And, and he's <laughs> and Irish or Scottish people imitating the like exaggerated posh UK accent is very funny. It's like a redneck impersonating like a Yankee. <laughs> and uh and, and bless it all the cheese maker. <laughs> and and but he like redid that whole scene, you know, where all the Sermon on the Mount mistakes, and I'm like that's high quality. I feel like y'all should do a a mystery science theater three thousand where it's just the Jesus seminar duo <laughs> have commentary <laughs> while they watch movies. while they watch Jesus movies. I just I kind of love it. That's a great question. I, really, nobody's ever asked me that question before, and and I think it's interesting because because Bra- uh, 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 Dom and and Marcus actually did have. Uh, they have both great senses of humor. And uh, I was, just, I mean, that's what I was talking about, how joy and laughing and all this sort of stuff. I mean, this is, to me, that's a necessary component of Christian formation is the capacity to just let it go, you know, is the, the, the joy of heaven just breaks into everything. And I, and, and in fact, that's, that's kind of why I love uh, Jesus Christ Superstar. Mm-hmm. And, and I can remember when I was a teenager <laughs> listening to that record, I got into so much trouble when my parents would come in, they would say, that's not very reverent. You know, I'd be dancing around in my room. What's the news? Tell me what's happening. What's the news? Tell what's happening. You know, and so, so, I mean, I thought it was like a party, you know, it's mm-hmm. like the gospel was a party to me in that. And even when it got serious and sad and, you know, it's, oh my God, Jesus is going to die. It was still, it was still lyrical, you know, mm-hmm. it took me to, it took me places. And, um, you know, I've always, I always love uh, musicals anyway and Broadway. So that's just part of who I am. Well, what's your favorite Godspell song then? You have a favorite. Oh, I don't know. What's the, uh, uh, I re- I'm trying to remember which one. The People in my Bible church like that one better. The well, it's, it there's more. less heresy, less yeah, heresy in it. That's right. That's what they said. Oh my gosh, you can't like Jesus Christ Superstar. There's no resurrection. They would always freak out about that. There's no resurrection. It's like, okay, there wasn't in the book of Mark either, but I didn't say that when I was 15 to them. That's, <laughs> so, yeah, they, they, I don't know if they're I, ready to hear that. I was a troublemaker at the time. <laughs> so. Yeah, the, uh, you know, you know what's fascinating. Um, all right, I'm just adding one question because someone asked it, and then I started going. Like, I don't know what Diana thinks about this, and I really want to know. Someone said that, that who uh, who was a part of the whole emerging church movement and everything, um, and, and they asked, uh, like, how does Diana see the history of the emerging church movement, its changes, and how does that whole you know, previous kind of 10 year merging church movement compared to the new eruption of people deconstructing or whatever uh, in the current process, like what happened to the emerging church movement and how does it differ from the current one? You know, I think a lot of people expected emergent church stuff to 
you know, sort of go from movement to institution, go from movement to successfully, you know, changing uh, certain things about the way congregations and perhaps even denominations work. But uh, but I, I don't think that it was a movement that worked that way. I mean, I think it was a movement that created friendships. And a lot of those friendships now have lasted for decades and that people have done their work, not necessarily in the service to renewing institutions, but uh, solely, you know, we've done this work in, in conversation with one another and in service to where we thought the spirit was moving in the world. And so there are people who moved more into sort of justice questions with uh, some of the impulses from those conversations 20 years ago. Some people who've moved more into academia, some people who have become more distinctly associated with particular theological traditions. An awful lot of people from emergence moved into process theology. And, um, and uh, then, uh, you know, I think that one of the things that I've done is I've tried to just create conversations in the world uh, to make space uh, for people to think about God differently. So instead of it being about liturgy or an institution, it's um, for me become almost a kind of an evangelistic task uh, on a, a very personal basis to have conversations with my readers that open their eyes to a different future of faith. And so, so I think that we all we met at a moment in history, we inspired one another, we influenced one another, and we continue to walk. Some of us together, some of us a little bit further apart than we once were, um, but I think that we all still hold that it's a common kind of journey and that we wouldn't be where we are um, without where we have been. So just because something doesn't become like the Methodist church, um, from Wait, being, is anyone trying to become the Methodist Church? I <laughs> well, I was thinking about what was the most spirit, successful spiritual movement of all times. It certainly had to be the Wesleys. Um, you know, it's just because the the Wesleys did that. Um, gosh, and should we bless them or curse them? Um, <laughs> the Methodists are probably asking that question for themselves right now. Love um, divine, all love. Yeah, we should bless selling. them for the music. Oh my gosh! Yeah, you got it, Mint. Like, Those are hymns. Think of how many hymn, hymnals would just have the penal all over the place if it wasn't for Wesley hymns. Oh, my Wesley's gosh. Like, yes. Don't you think we should broaden out the work of God and Christ to include imparting infinite love into the beating heart of the church? <laughs> and then like Isaac Watts, like, ah, no, no, no. The Calvinist gets the revenge, you know? Yeah. <laughs> So, but, uh, but anyway, yeah. So, you know, just because emergent doesn't become sort of institutionalized and the, and have an, a lasting institutional label doesn't mean it failed. It, it meant that it was a particular kind of movement for a particular moment. Yeah. No, and, and I do think people, um, uh, all right. Uh, this is on a live stream. So I'm changing my mind about what I was going to say. Uh Oh, I know. I know. <laughs> Well, you have to do that when you get older. You have to self-edit. Um, <laughs> you do? Yeah. I'm not <laughs> saying I'm good at it, Diana. But um, so the last part of that question was was like from that whole journey in the past and then like processing it with a more mature voice in the last four uh, books, um, is there particular wisdom for those just now discovering um, there's like another live option. I, I get people find the podcast. They send me emails and they're doing stuff. They're like, is there even a way to be Christian without insert things that I haven't even been to a church that does that in forever. And I'm like, yeah, I, there's a lot of options. There's actually the Catholic church doesn't do it that way. Mainline Protestants, not worried about these things. Like, but for those that are just now coming out of and starting that kind of <gasps> shock moment, um, it, yeah, uh, the, my main advice goes back to the, the sort of really powerfully deep part of our conversation about corporate stuff and security is that don't be afraid. Um, and I, I think that's there are lots of strands of Christianity that hold people 
um, as members or hold people's kinds of theological imaginations hostile, and they do it through fear, because they're while corporations do it, you know, or demanding security in order to protect their markets, religious institutions demand security in effect um, by trying to hold their members. Uh, and the security they offer is that you'll have eternal life, you know. And so there's they create this fear that when you die, you you will cease to exist. Nothing will ever matter again. You're going to just disappear. In both cases, the corporation or the religious corporation, it's it's about um, you know creating a a marketplace, you know, for your ideas, and it's a marketplace based on fear, whether it's winding up in hell or winding up impoverished you know and and so there is, is journeys can start out of fear um and i would never want to say that you can't start a journey out of fear and there will also be fearful times along any journey but keep going just just keep going and know that your story is unique, but there have been people who have walked paths that are very close to yours. And so you're not alone. And the more you can do to try to reach beyond the path that you're on and try to, you know, sometimes you're grabbing for hands in the dark. Um, you will find other people and you will find, you will find podcasts and books and wisdom and you'll find friends in church history and you'll find friends who are alive now that will surprise you mm -hmm. so just try don't be afraid keep going definitely that excellent advice so i've had a blast getting to talk to you um even though half the questions i had planned to talk about we didn't get to um <laughs> it was like we lapsed into a conversation we would have had without being on the internet but that just means there's uh, it's a, even a better reason to go get the book Freeing Jesus. Um, and there, there is a really powerful p chapter in here about when I chose a fearful and wrong way to follow Jesus, chapter five. And I talk about how that almost ended my life. Mm -hmm. And it's a incredibly honest. I, I, I terrified myself when I wrote that chapter. And so it's a very honest sort of dissection of deconstruction and what can go wrong. And I put it there purposefully to encourage people to know that you can sometimes go the wrong way. And, when, and even when you do, you can, there's still plenty of capacity to turn around and go back toward the way of love. And so, so I, I definitely want people to know that. that Freeing Jesus is not a book about a perfect sort of path towards a Jesus that is free of every encumbrance of conservative Christianity. It's a, it's a lurching, honest, searching story about who Jesus is and finding Jesus in, in profoundly uh, difficult circumstances sometimes, while also finding Jesus in your Barbie house. And so... I try to make I tried the book the book mm -hmm. to be as much to be as real as it possibly could be. It came from my experience, and so so in that way, I just want to affirm people who are yeah. listening. You know, is that your experience really matters? Your story really matters. To, it matters to the Jesus story. It matters to the people around you, and I just want you to live it as fully and beautifully with as much grace and goodness as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you for hanging out. It's been a blast. Um, I'm I'm really glad we met each other a long time ago. Yeah, and, me too. Uh, you tolerated me when I was annoying. I mean, I might still be, but I don't I don't get the vibe that you're deciding if I'm annoying anymore. You know. <laughs> I think at first I wasn't quite sure. <laughs> well, you aren't the only one. But I just adore you, Trip. I think you're wonderful. And, uh, you know, I thought if we were free this year, I would have definitely come to Scotland while you were there to visit and see Edinburgh with you. Well, um, you know, 
I we would have had fun. So I'll just we I'll would've. just dream about whatever it is we would have done. Hopefully, we wouldn't have got arrested, but not close. <laughs> <laughs> it was it maybe Richard would have talked us out of getting in trouble. <laughs> Well, I love Edinburgh. I'm trying to think of where we would get arrested. Hmm. I have a list. I have a list. Um, we got another month. They just added a month before things really opened up again because of the new variant. So, uh, yeah, we'll see. I just, uh, well, I hope you get out of your basement once in a while there. It's true. I, I keep wondering what exactly I could do with all this stuff. It's, um, we found a sander and, um, Alicia is much more crafty than me. You know those uh, thing pallets they use, like a, a moving stuff around at a warehouse. Yeah. Uh huh. She built a a bench out of pallets, um, then like sanded it, painted it like six different pastel colors, and polished it, and then like weatherized it in a way it looks vintage, even though it was just made. Wow. Um, because we found all the like down here, like sanders and a nail gun and all sorts of stuff. Um, I was, I was like, well, oh, who knows what else is down here? I don't know. I could build all sorts of stuff. Did Nothing you illegal. The garden? Facebook. Uh, yeah. It, well, it's a, uh, it's in the front, the front yard where she can like in the day when Haven's running around when everyone else is gone um, and he's playing in sand and stuff, you can use it. So lovely. Yeah. I I was like I was I did construction one summer and then got straight A's after that. I was like, <laughs> uh, I can't do I, I can't do this. I'm not gifted. <laughs> well, you're busy uh building a theological vision of yeah, the world. That's right. There you go. <laughs> that's right. You're welcome, universe. But uh thank you. Tell Richard hi. And um did y'all have fun for the birthday? Yes, I hope you did too. Oh, yeah. It's always good to find out people have close birthday. I have a whole bunch of friends that are like all born the same week I was. So it was a big week for birthdays. So I was, I, you know, and I told everybody on Twitter it was your birthday. So I hope a lot of people said happy birthday to you. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I support all positive attention. You don't have to have to worry. Like, if I you was say to yourself, I, I want to say worried. something nice. Um, you could say it. I, I know plenty of people would be like, I don't, don't give me any extra attention. Me, on the other hand, <laughs> I mean, I might downplay it publicly, but just know I always appreciate it. And Good. people tweet nice things. I'm just like, I think I'm going to retweet that just so other people know people send nice things about me. I think um, that that's important. Yeah. And uh, and uh, I was a little worried about you being lonely. So uh, I wanted people to say nice things to you. Well, it was successful. It was Good. successful. All righty. Well, I'm going to bed. It's almost midnight. It's late. <laughs> but, uh, I have to finish a piece for CNN on Southern Baptist. Oh, whoa. I know. Good luck. You, Thank you. <laughs> I just, you know, I I don't, the second conservative takeover only went, they only went halfway. That's what I gathered from reading Twitter. Oh, and yeah. They're, they're like not, the most they're conservative person. Oh, they're not done yet. I, oh, I don't. No, no. The, this convention is done, but they're not done yet. They'll be back. Uh, and <laughs> don't. If Paige Patterson can find some buses, don't. Anyway. Uh, uh, next time we're not being on the Internet. Remind me to tell you about the time I Paige Patterson. I waited tables for Paige Patterson when I was working at Applebee's in undergrad. It's a fascinating story and uh, it may cohere with your internal prejudice that's why <laughs> i wasn't going to share it online i only have one question does he tip well um no i didn't think so no um <laughs> i'm sure it's because he graded one paper at the table and probably charged it to the seminary just like all the taxidermy for all the dead animals in his house and the new um china but who knows I don't, I don't know all the details. I don't know the details. Um, but as someone that grew up in Wake Forest, I do know that guy got in charge and the city hates the seminary for all the, re for all the things he did. Like, that's when they switched from like 
look, stick on uh, parking passes to hangers because the cops were <laughs> not thrilled with it. And um, uh, yeah, they like promised not to sell his property and then did and then developed it and stuff. And obviously did it for the glory of God, just like everything else he's done that most people call unethical. But, you know. The greatest theological bookstore and used theological bookstore in all of America was in Wake Forest. Stevens Bookshop. I know. Yep. Well, I sat next to uh, uh, Mr. Stevens at church, Millbrook Baptist Church in Raleigh before he moved to Scotland walking bibliography like oh yeah i tell him i'm working on he'd come to church and he was like i have a few suggestions (laughs) okay my friend you have a good night's sleep great to be with everybody at home brood all right okay bye